everyone, and welcome to episode two of season two of The Shiro's Project. My name is Nishka Iyer, and I am the executive director. Hi, I'm Malika, and I'm the director of operations for The Shiro's Project. And today we are so excited to welcome Leandra James, who is the director of data analysis at W Promote. So Leandra, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. And we are really excited to get to know more about you and your journey. Awesome, thank you for having me. Yeah, so Leandra, I mean, you've had quite the journey to get to where you are today. And from what I understand, you weren't always headed towards a career in technology. So would you be able to tell us a little bit about your route to a technical role and maybe the different industries that you've gotten the chance to work in and anything else you have? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess where do I start? In high school, I was always very like interested in math and physics. That was always something that I gravitated towards, but I was also very creative. Um, I was a violin player and I really loved music. And so when I went into undergrad, it was literally me choosing between being a music major or an actuarial science major. Those were sort of the two things I was considering at the time. And I think because now that I look back, I think it's just because I didn't really have a lot of examples in my community of people who work in STEM. Um, but I did have an aunt who played violin and I had a lot of family who were sort of musically inclined. So I guess it felt more comfortable and more familiar for me to go into music. Mm -hmm. um, but I did have to sort of um, negotiate with my parents with my major. And so I didn't just become a music performance major. I became a music and business major. Um, so that way, I guess I had something to fall back on. And so I wasn't just a music, just a plain music major. And um, throughout my studies, I took obviously music and business classes and a lot of the internships that I received, um, even though they were with music promoters or with record labels and things like that, my quantitative skills were always the, the one thing that was leveraged more. Mm -hmm. So working with spreadsheets or trying to figure out how to model something linearly or um, you know, doing data visualizations and things like that. And so I had the opportunity to really leverage my quantitative skills, although I was interning in creative fields. Mm -hmm. And it was because of that that I considered going to graduate school to expand on those quantitative skills. There was this really cool major at Carnegie Mellon out of their information systems school that was for students interested in entertainment industry, but it was quantitative and focused on like market research and um, using databases and programming and things like that, in addition to a strong business focus as well. So we took finance classes and um, film distribution classes and things like that. So it seemed like a really good fit for me. And it really exposed me to the tech field in general. I was in classes with people who were um, data analysis and information systems and public policy majors. We were all sort of based in the same school. And I also noticed that these students, their internships paid way more than the ones that, um, what we were called memes, uh, masters in entertainment industry management students. Um, and the MISMs, information systems management kids, I mean, they were getting like $60 an hour internships. And coming from the background that I did, that was a really high paying job, you know, mm -hmm. let alone an internship. So that was an attractive component to me. I was like, what am I doing? Like not going for those type of roles. Um, and again, in the internships that I received, even through graduate school, they really only care for your quantitative skills. I mean, all the other stuff is sort of um, very saturated. A lot of people want to work in entertainment. A lot of people want to be uh, creative directors or want to work in music publishing and things like that. Um, so it was actually easier to find jobs in tech in comparison to the, the roles I was previously applying to. Um, and I think that's pretty much, I think that's a good explanation of my, I guess my origins in tech because 
I say that I fell into it, but I think it was always something there that was driving me to that. That's really interesting to hear, particularly because I think younger women who are contemplating that kind of career change between fields can really look up to you as like an icon of someone who was able to kind of successfully change um, her career field, which Mm -hmm. kind of goes with me towards the next question of what advice can you give to people about excelling in technical roles with or without a STEM degree? Yeah, really, really good question. Um, Well, as someone who initially didn't come from a STEM degree, I would say you have to have curiosity um, and a willingness to learn and an openness to to receiving that information and not, and this takes time, at least it did for me, but not feeling um, like you have to compare yourself to others who perhaps do have more experience um, because everyone comes from completely different backgrounds. Everyone has different experiences, especially in like the data analytics and data science realm. Um, There's folks who have a programming background. There's folks who have a more mathematics background. There's people who have a stronger business acumen. Um, There's people who have more experience with like cloud architecture. Like there's literally everyone has their own angle. And so coming in as someone who um, felt a little bit, I guess, out of place, like that's okay. And even people with technical backgrounds feel that way. Like it's totally okay. Um, And I would recommend first really understanding what you want to do. Um, For me, it it seemed to make sense because I I liked math and I I was, I was not um, privy on programming, but once I started learning it, I was like, oh, this is, this is kind of cool and it's kind of fun. So I think exploring and and understanding what you like. um, And then once you understand what you want to go for, taking the time to study for it and taking the time to um, learn what you don't know and then learn that. And knowing that it's a, um, it's a, it's a never ending process. You never stop learning. No one's finished learning math, you know, mm-hmm. like it's, you're always going to be learning. Um, and on top of that, I would also say, don't let that hinder you. Cause a lot of people are uncomfortable with having to always learn. They just want to feel comfortable. Like, okay, I've, I've learned everything I need to know. I'm good. Um, I think in the tech field, that's generally not the case because technology is always changing. There's different methodologies and approaches that are always changing or they have different applications. So if you want to go into tech, I think it's probably important to be comfortable with not knowing things sometimes and wanting to learn new things. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that you're always working towards that time when you feel comfortable and you feel like you finally learned enough to succeed without anybody telling you what to do. So, I mean, Leandra, as a woman of color in the tech world, I'm sure that you've got experience with navigating some of the challenges that come with that title. Um, In particular, do you feel that gender and racial inequality in the tech community is lessening as time goes on? That's a really good question. Um, The experience that I had in tech, I can say that, to some people's surprise, not to mine, but to some people's surprise, is not necessarily more progressive than other industries. Mm -hmm. Um, um, It certainly can seem that way because it's like this, this like fancy new um, sort of quantitative based um, truth kind of industry where people think everything's just about the science and everything's about Um, you know, who's best, you know, merit will get you in certain places. Um, And because a lot of the industry is based in um, coastal cities that are typically liberal, like New York and San Francisco and LA and things like that. So I I think that tech has a good PR when it comes to that. But um, I wouldn't say that compared to other industries, it's like more progressive because at the end of the day, whether it's conscious or subconscious, you still experience um, people who are either surprised that you are where you are um, or 
um, uncomfortable that you are where you are, or they're uncomfortable with your title, or they're uncomfortable with the fact that you might be more knowledgeable than them in some areas. Um, and that's just something that I've, for, fortunately or unfortunately, I've sort of become used to in a way, and maybe that's just part of survival, but um, I was just talking to my fiance about this. Um, when I was in, well, throughout my whole academic career up until I graduated high school, I was a competitive chess player. Wow. And um, yeah, I used to play for the United States Chess Federation. And I was usually one of the only black girls mm -hmm. um, playing in a tournament typically. And the interesting thing about that, that experience is that you kind of directly see the response of your opponent when you're playing someone who um, is from a different background. And I remember experiencing people being surprised that I sat down across from them. Like, oh, I didn't realize my opponent was gonna look like you. Or when you, you do a move that kind, of, that kind of threw them off, they kind of realized, oh, you're actually competent. Or if you beat them, it's like, oh, that, that, that reflects on me in a way that I wasn't prepared to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I use that analogy because I still kind of experience those little microaggressions. Um, just, I think, in the tech community in general. Um, but I will say it's mostly a good experience. Um, I don't think that being a woman of color is, is um, has made my experience in tech bad. I wouldn't say that, but I would say that it comes, it always comes just as being who I am. It always comes with an extra um, layer of having to socialize with people and people not being used to you being who you are and where you are. Yeah, so as a follow-up to that question, in your opinion, do you think the tech community is doing enough to support and encourage women, specifically women of color, in order to pursue degrees and careers in technology? And if not, what more can and should be done? Yeah, that's a really hard question because I do see initiatives that like big tech companies, for instance, like Google or Amazon are, are doing to try to attract more um, diversity and I see universities doing it as well. Um, but it's to be fair to them, it is a really tough problem to solve for various reasons. Um, it's not just about starting a program where you're reaching out to people who, who are like women or who are black or who are queer. It's about reaching out through like the entire pipeline. Because for instance, as I mentioned, I was always interested in quantitative studies, mm -hmm. but I didn't see anyone in my community who did that. And so I didn't see myself in that, that sort of environment. And so I just went with what, you know, I saw myself in. Um, and there are other people who are more fortunate, you know, they have people in their family or people in their community who have sort of always been software engineers or they've always been doctors or something. So it was like a no brainer that they do something like that. So I think what, what can be done in addition to what's already happening is reaching out earlier in the pipeline with elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, um, and really, explaining to different people of different backgrounds why these sort of roles are a good fit for them, not why you should consider this thing that you think is weird and is totally unrelated to you, but why it's actually really relevant to you and why you would probably really love it. I don't think that's the approach that they're currently taking. And when I say they, I don't mean like one institution, but just everything, you know, mm -hmm. universities, um, employers, et cetera. Yeah. Well, so what do you feel could be some of the best tips or advice on how to navigate a world or a community, a workplace that wasn't made for people like you? I mean, that can be on the basis of gender or race or any other challenges that people are facing. Yeah. Um, 
Boy, these are really good questions. Um, navigating spaces that are not designed for you is always a tough question. It takes, it takes sort of an artfulness and sophistication. It is really an art form, I'd say. I think it all starts from within, mm -hmm. I think. Realizing that you belong where you are, no matter what external forces are telling you, you belong there because you are there. And because you know you put in your time and you put in your work and you've done the work and you don't need other people's validation. That's something that took me a while to learn. And I, I guess I'm still learning it in a way, but that was the first big leap for me was realizing you don't actually need other people to validate your existence. And once you learn that, it opens up a whole new world because it's like, oh, well, I don't need that person to tell me that I don't belong here or to look at my work and say, oh, well, it's okay. Or, oh, I would have done this way. You just have this confidence where you no longer require that validation. Um, so I think that's the first step. The second step, once you get there, is learning how to navigate um, hostility because sometimes you're gonna experience it regardless. And that honestly comes with practice, I think. Practice in, in um, having a mentor or having a community of other women or other people of color, or people who you identify with, having a group of people who you can kind of bounce ideas on, like how do I, how do you approach the situation? Mm -hmm. Having a support group how i mean how have you managed i know you spoke a little bit about this already but how have you learned or managed to maintain confidence in your path ooh um yeah there's a lot of things that i've done um because confidence has always been something that i struggle with within or outside of tech it's just like a general thing mm -hmm. um and so I think meditation actually helps me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I meditate a lot. Um, having a support system of friends and family who have seen your brilliance and can kind of like validate it. And I know I just said you don't need validation, but it's, it's nice to have a support group who can um, sort of testify yeah. to the things that you've done not necessarily validate, but they've been a witness to it and they can help you remember your value. In addition to that, I think realizing that it's okay to not know everything. Um, for me, being in tech, I think everyone kind of wants to feel like they know everything, but as I mentioned, there's an extra layer being a woman and being black where it's like, oh, I really have to know everything. Because if I don't, then that's an extra reason why someone can say I don't belong. Mm -hmm. So I had to get comfortable with just saying, if I don't know something, that's fine. No one knows everything. Let me go learn it. Mm -hmm. um, and so those have really helped me maintain confidence um, because there's there's nothing that makes you feel unconfident than than being, feeling like an imposter, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I do have imposter syndrome. Um, I think a lot of people do. And I think dealing with it is just a matter of addressing it and realizing that it's, it's normal. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a very real experience that a lot of women have is imposter syndrome. And then also um, what you were saying about validation, I think that that is something that as someone who is doing undergrad right now, it is something that we think about is wanting that external validation, mm -hmm. not necessarily from our support system who will give us that validation, but mm -hmm. from other people that we seek that from. And so that's mm -hmm. a really interesting um, piece of advice and kind of experience that you had. So mm -hmm. to follow up on that a little bit, um, we would love for you to tell us about Black Computers. So I'd love to hear about the organization as a whole. I know I'm kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, sorry about that. But I would love to kind of hear about the organization and your role, as well as how other young women who are listening to this can get involved. Yeah, definitely. 
So Black Computer is a think tank organization who I would say their primary focus is reaching out to women of color who work in tech and developing their skills. Um, and I sort of came across Black Computer by accident. I connected with um, a woman on LinkedIn who was part of their organization. And I asked her how, have, how has her experience been as a fellow? And she mentioned that she loved it. It was a very rare opportunity to be surrounded by other um, Black women in tech because it's, we are fairly rare. So to be surrounded mm -hmm. by women who are exclusively identifying in that way is sort of a, a rare, it's a rare experience. And I always thought that sounded awesome because being the only black women sometimes in a room, I, I you know, it gets kind of lonely. And so sometimes you wanna, you know, you wanna be surrounded by that and have that normality. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that other communities you know, that's a huge luxury to always be kind of surrounded by your image and know that it's normal. Um, yeah, yeah. And I don't really have that luxury. And I think women, a lot of times in general, we don't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. So it was really nice to be surrounded by other people that you can identify with who are brilliant, you know, and it reminds you like, yeah, I can do this. Like, look, all these people are doing it. Why can't I do it? So Black Computer is an organization that focuses on reaching out to young Black women um, in tech and doing research on the experience of Black women in tech. And they also have a fellowship program for Black women who want to focus on cybersecurity or data science or software engineering. And it's really a, I would say, um, a program that focuses on professional development and how to deal with microaggressions and how to deal with imposter syndrome and things like that. So I would say if any of your um, followers are interested in getting involved, they can definitely reach out to me um, and I can you know, make the connection. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's probably the best way or they can go to the website and I think there's a contact thing there, but if they want a more person, personable introduction, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. So I think that wraps up all of our big questions. And thank you so much for speaking with us today. I feel so lucky to have been able to just learn about your journey and also hear all of your advice. Um, but before we wrap up, we just have a few like rapid fire questions for you. So right. I wanted to start out with what motivates you? What motivates me? um being the best me yeah wow I really like that answer <laughs> um so our second rapid fire question is what are some of the coolest things that you have gotten to do so far in your career Ooh. um I would say when I was an operations analyst for Sunset Studios I got to work on some pretty cool projects for um Netflix and Hulu. So Hudson Pacific Properties, they own these Hollywood studios where um, like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was shot or I Love Lucy or a lot of Shonda Rhimes things were shot at these studios. Wow. And so being able to work on projects where it's like, how can we maximize the, the utilization of our sound stages for, um, for how to get away with murder, you know, like that, that was kind of cool. <laughs> yeah sounds really cool yeah and then finally what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self Ooh, um don't be scared to do something you're not familiar with great I think I mean that applies to me now I think also <laughs> so that's great to hear and that was our last question for today so Shiro's Project viewers and listeners, thank you so much for tuning in to episode two and be sure to keep up with us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube page if you haven't already. Thank you so much, Leandra, for joining us. Um, it's been really exciting and just been a pleasure to get to talk to you and learn more about your journey and your career. Um, so thank you so much again. Absolutely. Thank you.